Hi there, it's Ben from World Have Your Say. This is a download from the BBC. If you want to read our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. Here's today's programme. We've heard the news from the BBC. Now it's your turn. You can post on facebook.com slash worldhaveyoursay or get in touch via Twitter at BBC underscore WHYS. Welcome to World Have Your Say. Hello, I'm Ravia Limbardo. Welcome to the programme. We're with you for the next hour as we get reaction from Rome because in the last half an hour, black smoke has been seen rising from the chimney above the Sistine Chapel, which means no Pope has been elected yet. We'll be talking to World Have Your Say's Nuala McGovern, who's in St Peter's Square. We're also asking you if you expect Hollywood films to accurately portray real-life events. It's after Iran said they would sue the makers of Argo, the Oscar-winning film about the 1970s. 79 US embassy siege. They argue the film gives an unrealistic portrayal of the country. But do you expect Hollywood to always tell the truth, especially when depicting real life events? Chaying on Facebook says, No, let's sue the makers of the Avengers film for never saving anyone in Africa. It's a movie, Iran, made for entertainment and to win awards, not to teach history. So you're listening to World Have Your Say. Let's talk about Iran now, because Iran say they want to sue the makers of films like Argo for distorting the country's image and failing to be balanced. We've been asking you on our Facebook page if it matters if Hollywood films tell the truth. Template in the UK says not at all. Films are entertainment and must always be seen as fiction, which is a statement that the laws on expression support. And Ibrahim says, of course, America always portrays itself as the hero in all movies, when in actual fact, they're the real villains. To talk to us about this is George Perry, film critic and writer, Matthew Machowski, nuclear security research fellow specialising in Iran, uh, Arash Karami, Iranian journalist and blogger for Al Monitor at Iran Pulse, and Podrick Reddy. Index on censorship is where he works and provides expert comment on international free expression issues. Welcome to all of you. Uh, George Perry, maybe you can kick this off. Why does it matter how closely scripts stick to facts when portraying real-life events? Well, I don't think it does matter all that much. Um, There's an old saying in Hollywood, never let the facts interfere with a good story. Um, And in the case of Vargo, which is actually, I think, a superb film, the um, writers have... um, portrayed it in such a way that they've told they've they've got you on the edge of your seat for practically the whole film um what the, iran is criticizing um how they were portrayed 34 years ago um and they feel that they ought to sue for misrepresentation well this opens up an incredible can of worms i mean imagine if every german felt sensitive about the way the Germans have been portrayed in films for goodness knows how many decades because of the Nazis and so on. Um, you know, you just simply can't do this. Um, they, they can try and sue, but where on earth do they sue? I mean, who's going to take it seriously? Arash Karami, maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more about the issues that Iran have with Argo. Uh, yes, I, I think their issue isn't necessarily historical inaccuracy, although that's what they say. You know, they made a movie about the 2009 Green Movement, green movement in Iran, and that was full of lies as well because they want to present their own facts. So I don't think it's got any kind of adherence to uh, film purity by any means. I think their uh, concept is, by their suing and what they said in the press conference, is that they want an apology. And really, they feel that they're being attacked somehow. And if you see even the UN ambassador, um, uh, Mohammad Khazari, when he was on Farid Zakaria even, he said that I'll invite the filmmakers to Iran and afterwards they will offer an apology to the big nation of Iran. So I feel like they're being bullied. They want to present themselves and they're going to say, hey, we're not going to just take this standing down. And they understand how powerful Hollywood is in uh, shaping perceptions of Iran. And they know they're not particularly like this. The latest uh, Gallup poll has shown that Iran's not necessarily well liked across the world. Uh, Matthew, maybe you can come in here now. I mean, it's uh, they want an apology, but it's it's fiction and or is it fact? Which would you which which class would you put it in? Um, right, it, it is it is definitely a film fiction film. It does portray some historical facts. Some of those historical facts are not uh, necessarily put into right historical background. 
Um, just recently, we had uh, Iranian's first ever Islamic Republic's uh, president, Abdul Hassan Bani Sadr, actually writing in his editorial that he believes that the movie actually supports, uh, well, that the movie actually plays into the hands of the Ayatollahs and plays into, uh, uh, even supports the um, creation of uh, further um, uh, further alienation of Iran, uh, which perhaps some of the Ayatollahs want, actually. But it's also, it, it is many of those facts are certainly true. Um, the hostages were obviously taken. But at the same time, it is also important to remember that there was a large group among the uh, politicians in Iran. Um, Bani Sadr actually claims that most of the government at the time was against uh, the hostage taking. And in fact, the prime minister, uh, uh, Bazargan, resigned as soon after the hostages were taken because he saw... Uh, the hopes for liberal democratic Iran fading, and he believed that he could do nothing to um, help the hostages and, and relieve them. So, who? I suppose what you're asking, what, what you're saying there is that it's about portraying people in a certain light. Yes, um, and some people, go, many many of the people I spoke to in in London. Um, people that don't really know much about Tehran, when they came out of the movie, they uh, told me, well, this is just another neocon image of Iran, and I feel that every Iranian is a terrorist. Actually, one has to remember that many, obviously those um, students were very radical, but they were just one faction within Iran. And Iran is a very particular country in which you don't have a party system, but you have a factionist system. And those factions have been playing against each other over the entire history of, of the Islam, Islamic Republic. And in this movie, we have an image of just one of those factions. The I believe it, they were called the followers of the Supreme League. Leader. And the supreme leader actually played uh, between various factions towards his own um, objectives. George Perry, it's not the first time that Iran have complained about how they're portrayed. In fact, that they were saying in that uh, press conference that they wanted to, to make filmmakers who've uh, portrayed Iran in a bad light. What other issues have they had with the way in which Hollywood depicts them? Well, you see... You see. All, all this is all very well, but these, the people who are, who are making this fuss don't seem to understand what the purpose of the film is. The purpose of the film is to tell a story. If you start giving it all the definitions you want to give it, uh, you, you, you know, and explain the complicated political situation, the different factions and so on, you'll create an extremely boring film that nobody will want to go and see. Um, and that, that's the last thing that um, Hollywood wants. They, they want you to see this film, and uh, they need to simplify the story to make it exciting. It's as simple as that. George makes an important point there. Hi, Podrick. Really. Hi, Podrick. What the, what the Iranians really want is that they want they want utterly uncritical portrayals of of the revolution. Um, so we've seen this before um, when they were heavily critical of um, Marion Sarchapi's um, animated um, film uh, Persepolis, which was about growing up um, in Tehran during the revolution. And you know, it was a very beautiful, um, very cleverly put together film, and it was immediately denounced by Tehran as Islamophobic. Um, they, and beyond even wanting historical fact, what they want is utterly uncritical portrayals of the Islamic Republic, which would not only make for very dull films, it would also make for very much more dishonest and inaccurate films than, than Argo. As George says, the purpose of a film is, is to tell a story. It's, it's not a documentary. Absolutely. Yes, I mean, we look at, um, for example, where I'm from in Ireland, um, there was you know, Neil Jordan made, made a film um, about the revolution, um, revolutionary figure Michael Collins, and one critic at the time said that the problem with Neil Jordan was that he knew too much about Irish history and he was trying to squeeze everything into two hours, which means that you conflate characters, you conflate situations, and you're giving an impression of what happens. But, also, but it's not your job to tell a perfectly accurate story. Your job is to make an entertaining film which will, might give some insight into a period of time, but first of all, be an entertaining and interesting film. Uh, let's speak to Mohammed, who's joining us from London. Hi, Mohammed. 
Mohammed, can you hear us? Maybe not. We'll try and call Mohammed back and maybe. Can I add something here is, uh, I really wanted to add the fact that I think um, Iran also they they don't they understand that Hollywood isn't run by necessarily U.S. foreign policy. They have that understanding. Whereas in Iran, you need a license to make every film. But I don't. I think they've underestimated George Clooney's influence and the amount of uh, awards this has received as well. They really can't fathom the idea that there's a possibility that perhaps George Clooney or the studio put a lot of effort into this movie getting awards, and they really do think that it's based on U.S. foreign policy. So I do think they have some difficulty distinguishing between uh, these two uh, different systems. Well, it, it's, it's very true that um, uh, there is a tendency in certain regimes to believe that all, um, all messages that emanate from, from there are actually somehow sanctioned by the regime so that they think that you know, any American film has to be the voice of American foreign policy, which, of course, is nonsense because Hollywood you know, operates to its own rules. It doesn't give a damn what Washington thinks. Um, as has been shown in, in many instances. I think to extend that point even beyond um, even beyond Hollywood, um, if one casts one's mind back to the Innocence of Muslims um, row um, recently, the the, the um, controversy over that and the riots that took place, you saw a lot of a lot of countries, you know, saying, well, why can't the um, the United States do something about this? And uh, President Obama did, you know, point out in a while that he personally wouldn't endorse them, that that it was a matter for the filmmakers, and that that understanding necessarily is not necessarily always there. But there's there's a problem with authoritarian regimes, and in, in that, the, by their very nature, they are they are literal, um, and that does not suit um, the vagaries of of filmmaking and other artistic endeavours, which which deal in subtlety, which deal in irony, um, that have no place um, in authoritarian regimes. So you just have to cast your mind back to uh, the Satanic Verses, um, which was obviously, you know, uh, dealing with you know, very complex, layered narratives, which the Islamic Republic and the Ayatollah Khamenei uh, either did not see or simply refused to see and oh, could only take it on as, as an attack on Islam and portray as an attack on Islam. Iran has, uh, Iran certainly has I'd like to add, sorry, the, also, I think one reason why they've done such a harsh reaction and they've really gone over the top is they really do see themselves in a cultural war with the U.S. and with Hollywood. And I think to kind of target Hollywood and kind of put all this pressure behind it, they're in some ways saying, okay, this is our next enemy and this is our next front, in a way that I think this is much more dangerous for them than anything else that they've been presented with. And they realize that their population is changing and embracing it. You know, as much as people might have not liked Argo, it was actually very popular in Iran. Everyone wanted to see it. So they know what they're up against. They know the power of Hollywood and changing perceptions and uh, defining perceptions. So I think they really have that fear. And even when you see Iranian filmmakers that are successful in Hollywood or their films are successful in Europe or received an Oscar, The Iranian government is never happy about that. They're never excited about it because they feel like these films are still portraying them or it's portraying uh, faults within the Islamic Republic that they don't want portrayed out in the open and the public. So they do have this sense that they're in a cultural war with Hollywood and with the U.S. And I think they sense that they're losing this. This is another point that I think should be addressed. Iran may certainly agree that uh, the people in Iran, in the regime, in the re- Iranian regime, actually know that uh, Hollywood is independent. But the problem here also is with the fact that Michelle Obama was the one to award it uh, the prize. And this in Iran was per- perceived to be extremely political. Uh, many have said that uh, Michelle Obama being, on, uh, being the one giving the award basically meant that the President Obama agreed with the film and uh, endorsed the film. And that certainly was the problem. But the additional uh, interesting point in the story is also that uh, there was also some discontent coming from uh, the British Foreign Office. Um, Sir, um, Sir Graham, uh, uh, Sir John Graham, who was the ambassador at the time in Iran, he came out and said that he was uh, actually very unhappy and infuriated by the fact that the British were perceived to portrayed in the image as the ones who turned their backs on the Americans, mm. where, in fact, historical truth is quite the opposite. 
um, the American hostages, were, well, the Americans who escaped, were actually given um, given some space uh, um, within the British uh, residential compound for some time until they had to be moved elsewhere for security purposes. Yes, so, so that the, the, the clearly is that. a bit of this historical distortion. I, 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 can, I can see see the point there, but the trouble is that um, if they had included the British participation, it would have actually slowed down the pace of the film. Um, and uh, I, I can see why um, they, they decided to go st straight for the jugular, ignore that part of it, because that slowed the story up. You see, the trouble is, history is, is not particularly tidy. Um, <laughs> George, I'm going to pause you there because we are coming up to the news. George, Matthew, Arash and Padraig, if you can stay with us until after the news headlines, be really grateful. If you want to get in touch and uh, send us your comments to the debate, world have your say at bbc.com. You're listening to World Have Your Say. We're asking if you expect Hollywood to always tell the truth when depicting real-life events. Iran certainly thinks so and wants to sue them for distorting the country's image. And does Barcelona make history by overturning a 2-0 deficit to make it into the Champions League quarter-finals? We ask if Lionel Messi is the greatest player ever. Join the conversation, facebook.com slash worldhaveyoursay. We've heard the news from the BBC. Now it's your turn. You can post on facebook.com slash world have your say. Or get in touch via Twitter at BBC underscore WHYS. Welcome to World Have Your Say. Hello, welcome back to the programme. I'm Rabia Limbardo. We're getting your thoughts on whether Hollywood should be expected to show things exactly as they happened. What do you expect some artistic licence? Selector on Facebook says, not that anyone should watch films as a way to learn about historical events, but if it came down to choosing one or the other, I'd take the Hollywood version over a Holocaust-denying regime's views on historical events. Uh, Mathis says, if it's based on a true story, it doesn't mean the entire film is filled with truths. It can be romanticised or exaggerated. When a country or person is concerned about the image displayed, it means the filmmaker has put his finger on a sore point. And Joy, uh, Joy, Jay sorry, says they don't call it the entertainment business for nothing. Hollywood takes an artistic licence with everything that they do. They mould and shape a movie to cater to its bigger audience, the USA. As in the movie, tell the Iranian government... Uh, I probably couldn't tell you what you could tell the Iranian government. Uh, thank you very much, Jay, uh, for uh, for your message. You can get in touch with your thoughts and we'll uh, we'll read them out for you. You can log on to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash world have your say. Get in touch via email, world have your say at bbc.com. With us to talk about this for a few more minutes is George Perry, film critic and writer, Matthew Machowski, nuclear security research fellow specialising in Iran, Arash Karami, Iranian journalist and blogger for Al Monitor, and Podrick Reddy uh, from the Index on Censorship. Uh, maybe we can go to you first again, George. Um, does it really matter if they change anything in movies? I'm talking about race or nationality. Um, I think, you know, you ha let, let's face it, you cannot be literal in film. You really cannot, because, first of all, you, you know, to attempt to recreate the past accurately is, is, uh, an, is so daunting, it's, it's pretty much impossible. So you have to shortcut. And sometimes it means that you do have to change chronology, you have to change characters, you have even, you know, I can think of instances where you even change nationalities in order to tell the story. Um, well, give us and, some examples, George. Well, I, I, I could give you an example of, of where, where a country has become so incensed by its portrayal that they have a uh, attempt to take action. I think several million dollars. I don't know what even happened to the loss. And uh, that was when when Borat was made, um, and he apparently libelled Kazakhstan to the extent that they they were so appalled that the image presented on the screen of a country where all the women were prostitutes and where people lived in in pigsties. And to uh, this day, the the wrong national anthem is played for 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 yes, Kazakhstan, exactly. isn't it? because people believe that that was the one that was used because it was used in the movie. Um, but the, the effect that Borat had was that people ended up laughing at Kazakhstan and, and that was a real, uh, really sore point for the country, wasn't it? 
I think it must have been. I think, as I say, say it's taken them years to recover. And and one of the, the, the sinister things you have to think too, and this goes back to the, the Iran thing, is that um, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen is Jewish. Um, Iran suspects that Hollywood is actually a Jewish conspiracy. Um, and uh, I, I actually don't think that uh, the people who, who run Hollywood even think politically like that. I think they, they just think in terms of trying to make as much money as they can in order to survive in a very difficult industry. Martin has called in from Berlin. Hi there, Martin. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm very well. Have you seen the film? What did you make of it? I haven't watched the film yet. But I just called to uh, to chip in my contribution in form of like I cap- I happen to come from Uganda and uh, I happen to synchronize the movie uh, The Last King of Scotland, and as we know now that the the, the, the setting was in Uganda and um, during the movie the uniforms of the policemen, the, a lot of facts actually you know distorted. And that caused a bit of anxiety in some Ugandans and circles. Did it matter to you? Day, sorry? Did it matter to you? Um, it mattered. Well, at, at, at the first instance, while, because first of all, one, as, as being a Ugandan, you want, you want the whole, to, you, you want the movie to portray the truth as much as possible. But at the end of the day, you just have to settle with it because it's really entertainment. Although uh, some parts of, of 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 the body of the of the film might carry some truth, but um, it's a movie. It's not a it's not a it's not a documentary. Arash Karami, Iranian uh, journalist, blogger for Al Monitor. You're still with us, aren't you, Arash? Well, I I think okay, Hollywood does not have any kind of obligation to historical accuracy. I I agree with that. Um, however, I think what really adds uh, insult to injury is when Ben Affleck says the film was completely realistic, or when Zack Snyder, the director of Three Hundred, goes gives an interview and says his depiction of Xerxes was completely realistic. I think that's what becomes insulting. And for me, that's when I realize okay, well, you don't understand you have artistic license. But at the same time, when you tell people that you're making a realistic film, the fiction, whether it's Thirsties or the Revolution, it's difficult. No, no film could actually encompass, even, not even a documentary, can completely encompass all the truth that was exactly. the hostage crisis or any kind of event. But I think when the directors have this uh, certain ego about themselves, as if they completely adhere to every single fact, I think that's when it starts becoming insulting. That's, I think it's when a general audience uh, might be turned off or general people might be turned off outside of the politics of it. And it's a, it, this perception that it will stick in someone's mind. I mean, th- there's also this issue that in years to come, when uh, younger people, when children watch these films, and if they're used as some kind of uh, a, a tool of, of educating people on historical events, that's all they remember is what they've seen in the film. That could pose a problem. And, uh, that does cause a problem. You know, me, I grew up in America. I was born in Iran. I grew up in America. And whenever I meet somebody that does, is not familiar with Iranians, the first thing they ask me is uh, about Not Without My Daughter, the film that was made, uh, the film was about made, uh, the husband that takes his wife back to Iran and keeps her there. So, I mean, that really defines people's perceptions. So the fact that I have to answer that question still today, I think is really telling about how powerful Hollywood is. And, Arash, do you think anything will come of Iran's threat to sue the filmmakers of Argo? I don't know. The, the lawyer... Um, the lawyer said that she's going to hire somebody within the U.S. as well uh, to kind of pursue the case. Obviously, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, and I don't think they have a case. And, uh, and if I re- I've been reading a lot of the comments in the Iranian website, that people are, uh, are a little bit already critical of it, and they're saying, why are you spending money on this lawyer to go spend money on another lawyer when we have all these issues at home? So this might, uh, I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but I think there might be a backlash. If, if not, there's already an online backlash against spending money on this lawyer to do this. George, maybe for some historical context here, but has there ever been uh, anyone who's been sued successfully for portraying their country badly? I, I, I can't think of, um, a, 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 of that actually happening. I can, rem- I, well, I, I can put something in, in a historical context, because I mentioned the Nazis earlier. Um, before the war in Britain, uh, the British Board of Film Censors took a view that... Uh, films 
should not actually criticize the Nazi regime. And in 1938, Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock, made a film called The Lady Vanishes, which was about a... Um, uh, um, what well, is an espionage story, and uh, it involved a, a flight from from you know what was obviously a, a, a Nazi regime. And people who saw the film you know, identified the villains in the piece as 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 Nazis. But the fact of the matter is that they are never named as such. Um, there's no not a single German uniform anywhere in the film. It was set in in a kind of a strange mythical country in Europe. And the reason for that was that the BBFC had uh, issued specific instructions that under no, no circumstances were the filmmakers to, to um, make insulting references to Herr Hitler. And, and indeed, that's how it happened. And it came out the, the, the very week of the Munich crisis. And, you know, just a year before the war started. I'm sure we'll see what happens in this case. George, thank you very much for taking part in World of Yesterday. Also, Matthew, Arash and Podrick uh, for joining the conversation. Continue discussing this on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash world have your say.